Up next on Art Rocks, a husband and wife team in Alexandria with a magical talent for turning wood into sculptural masterpieces. I like thinking of what you want to do for a project and using the best medium that works the best for it. We meet the father of modern Iranian sculpture. I just made, gave a body to it because that was a, just a drawing in 3D. Then I realized that that was a great discovery. Make the connection between art and culture. Folk art is constantly evolving. It's an expression of a particular people and get to know an artist who's taking pumpkin carving to a whole new level. I just thought, that looks like an awful lot of fun. I, I should try that. That's all right now on Art Rocks. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello and thank you for joining us for Art Rocks. I'm James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine. It's an oft-repeated trope that in relationships, opposites attract. But one Alexandria couple has discovered that when it comes to creating arresting large-scale art installations, they are always on the same page. The combination of the two of us is wonderful because if I can draw it or make it out of pipe cleaners, anything that he can kind of see what I'm talking about, he can build it into a structure and then we go from there. She's better at any of this stuff than I am. She just goes on to other things that lets me have my part. Janet and Carl Ahrens have always expressed themselves artistically, but once they became empty nesters, the couple began taking on projects on a much larger scale. We were in charge of Mardi Gras ball for, I mean, a crew of women and they're gypsies. And so every year we did their decorations and it was kind of a year long event. Every year was a different thing. So Carl built some big pieces for those and we would build on the theme. We've done an elephant that you can ride on, has a howdah on the top of it, and it was all decorated and painted. Carl built a horse one year that's made to scale from a horse that um, was a friend of ours. So how does one make a horse like this from plywood? Carl says he carved the head and then built the frame of the horse from plywood. He then used a special saw to cut strips of wood that were one-eighth of an inch thick and then delicately and painstakingly wrapped it around the frame to capture the grace and power of a living, breathing horse. Carl says this project only took a couple of months of working nights and weekends. Between the two of them, the couple is willing to tackle just about any medium. I like thinking of what you want to do for a project and using the best medium that works the best for it, I guess you'd say. So it could be wood, it could be iron, it could be um, clay, paintings, anything that kind of like it all. Uh, and I love doing a show that puts it all together. You know, it is. how many different ways can you do something? My favorite is concrete. Well, we started out with this bench that's in the garden and we like that. Then I've done three or four four, I guess, no, five heads. One is right here by the back door. It's out of concrete. That are planters that you can put a plant in. Concrete wears you out and it wears your arm out. So I decided I better get into something a little bit lighter. So I started doing pottery. I like to do hand building and I also throw. I like the hand building the best because you can come up with something so different. You know, I've done um, practical pottery like dishes or plates or the throwing is more traditional and but you can do pretty much anything you can think of if you're hand building it so I really like that the best there's a lot to know about glazing 
uh, and when you get a piece that you really like and you like the way it turned out, it's like a miracle because sometimes it just, the glazes aren't always the same color as they're going to turn out. You really have to use your imagination and think of how you want it to turn out. I think that Frida head is, is fantastic. And there's a little organ grinder box up on the shelf in there that she made out of clay. It's really good. She has tremendous imagination and ideas. And she thinks of things for me to do. She's an artist, my artistic director. The Art of Spain, an exhibit of Spanish religious icons that travel to the Aaron's home city, called on them to develop pieces using a Louisiana material not often associated with works of art. We uh, cut cypress knees and made angels out of the cypress knees because it was the biggest thing I could think of for these huge round tables in this huge room. What could you make angels out of that would be um, substantial enough to show up in this room? And so we did angels uh, from every walk of life, really. Carl's experience working with wood goes all the way back to his childhood. I've always done carving. I whittled when I was a kid. I always liked to carve. I just never thought about doing it seriously on any scale. I uh, went out fishing trip out west and saw some totem poles and took a picture of some of them and my brother just happened to have a big cedar tree fell in his yard and brought it to me and I said, well, that's a totem pole. You get inspired. You see something, you think of what it could be and you become inspired to do it, to make it. Not only does the couple work seamlessly together in tandem, Janet particularly enjoys collaborating with other artists, as she did in a recent show where each artist was responsible for his or her own table setting. It was a very successful show. It was interesting. Each person just went over and above and knocked themselves out doing it. And it was so fun to see it all together because every person's was very detailed. We know the ones that are good at this and good at that and and when you put them all together it just comes out so great and that's kind of how whatever we do together is better than just one of us doing it. The Aaron's Home and Garden serves as a beautiful showcase of their diverse striking body of work and they say most of their shows are sellouts. As artists, neither Janet nor Carl had any formal training. They simply learned from doing and redoing until the concepts in their mind's eyes took shape. No matter where you live in Louisiana, opportunities to connect with the arts are everywhere, if only you know where to look. So here's a list of some of the goings on in the arts and culture around our state. To learn more about these and other events in Louisiana, visit lpb.org slash artrocks or pick up a free copy of Country Roads magazine. LPB's Art Rocks website also features an archive of previous episodes, so to see any segment again, just log on to lpb.org. Influential Iranian sculptor Parvis Tanavoli was born in Tehran, but he's lived in Vancouver, Canada since 1989. Influenced heavily by his native country's history, culture and traditions, Tanavoli's work appeared at the Davis Museum at Wellesley College in Massachusetts, giving visitors an introduction to the man considered the father of modern Iranian sculpture. He's a, like a blank spot on the radar of the U.S. consciousness in the arts. That's unthinkable and it's unforgivable. So here we have this amazing opportunity to redress the, the situation. The situation is that Pervis Tanavoli is regarded as one of the world's leading contemporary artists and certainly the highest selling Iranian one. For 60 years, he's produced sculpture, painting and jewelry, all rooted in Persian myths and culture. 
And yet the 77-year-old artist is only receiving his first major U.S. exhibition now at the Davis Museum, says its director, Lisa Fishman. Parviz has been collecting you know, tribal materials, um, handicrafts and artisanal uh, wares for decades. And what he's uh, demonstrated through that activity is the kind of richness, the visual richness, the material richness um, of the common landscape of daily life in Iran. Well, I must tell you, culture is flourishing. For as long as he can remember, Tanavoli says he's been enamored with poetry and music. It became his wellspring as a child growing up in Tehran, and today it colors his descriptions of his work. Cages are a recurrent theme. For most people, cages like a jail, you know, like a prison, but not to me, no. In my culture, poets talk about their chest as a cage. In that chest, there is a nightingale singing all the time, gets agitated, and that's what causes the poet to, to write poetry. There is an optimism and beauty that has infused Tanavoli's work, even when it wasn't present in his life. The Iranian revolution forced him to become an absent artist. There were a lot of difficulties to make a sculpture. There was no fuel, no power, uh, and then very little could have been done in my studio. That's why I started mostly reading, researching, and traveling the country. At the end, when I think about it, it was very fruitful and very much of learning for me. Because it, it caused you to do things you wouldn't have? Yes, exactly, exactly. Maybe if, if, if it wasn't uh, due to all these uh, turbulences, maybe I would have continued repeating myself in my art. Throughout war, Tanavoli literally continued to make something out of nothing. Heech is the Farsi word for nothing. And in the 1960s, Tanavoli began interpreting the word as it exists in the form of its Arabic script. The Heech is now a project 50 years running. I just made, gave a body to it because that was a, just a drawing in 3D. And that was only the start of it. And then I realized that that was a great discovery because it was very uh, elastic and was very uh, adaptable with other uh, objects. Does it have a character for you, a personality? Uh, he doesn't have a gender. I mean, this is a good question. Sometimes he uh, becomes like the beloved is a female and sometimes is like a friend, a male. And uh, so to me, it's a genderless uh, uh, sculpture. Today, Tanavoli produces his work from studios in both Vancouver and Tehran, although he's currently embroiled in a suit with Iranian authorities. The mayor of Tehran, who was a cultured man, he expressed his love to have a, uh, to turn my museum, my house into a museum with some of my artworks, and I accepted it. I thought that was a great idea. But then, soon after him, uh, Ahmadinejad became the mayor. He wasn't the culture man. He didn't like any of that. And he closed my museum down. And I had to fight uh, for nearly six years to get my house back. But my artwork were taken away. Even so, for his lifetime of prolific output, Tanavoli remains an iconic figure in Iran. His optimism is just as pervasive. Will you ever slow down? Not so far. Not so far. The age hadn't changed me, and I work the same as I used to do 20 years ago, 30 years ago. I, I don't get tired of my work, I mean. You're lucky. I think there are a lot of people who wish they could say that. I think I'm lucky. Although Tanavoli's work is no longer on display in Massachusetts, one of our sister stations captured it before the exhibit moved on. Out west now to New Mexico, where Albuquerque artist Catalina Delgado Trunk explores the mythologies of pre-Columbian Mexico. She shares inspirations drawn from the sophisticated Mesoamerican cultures that flourished for more than 4,000 years before the first contact with Europeans. Let's take a look. We all come here and we're all asking the same question. Where do we come from? Why in the world are we here? And where are we going? 
And every civilization or every culture, every group, has to answer those questions for themselves because it gives it a meaning to your own personal life. Myths answer these, these, these questions. They're very, very powerful in every culture. As an immigrant, I live between two worlds. And for many years, I really didn't feel like I had a sense of place and a sense of identity. All immigrants come with a basket, and there are three things in that basket that we all bring into the country, and that's food, language, and traditions. And I thought, well, then I have to start making use of my three seeds. I found that the easiest way for me was through my artwork, particularly with the oral stories. I am a folk artist, okay? I, I work papel picado, which is cut paper, uh, and it's called papel cortado or papel picado. Either way, it has, has a very long, long history. You have to remember that folk art in whatever discipline it's expressed is constantly evolving. It's an expression of a particular people of who they are, their identity. As you search for identity, and as you search for uh, a sense of place, you obviously go back to your past. What is it that you heard? What is it that you learned as a child? So you had to dig into the memory, and that's what I started doing. And some of the, the myths, mm, knew them kind of halfway, so I did a lot of, lot of research on them. I, I, uh, you can see I have an awful lot of books. I do a lot of reading, and you know, I keep going back to, to Mexico City and uh, exploring. And I've concentrated on one particular area, it's uh, the southeastern edge of Mexico City. Uh, Mishkik, Milpalta, Tecomilt. These are the areas that really stick to the real old traditions. I'm not an anthropologist, I'm not an archeologist. I just uh, learned a lot of this stuff for osmosis where I was growing up, uh, family stories, oral histories from, from neighbors and just mainly listening to them makes me remember a lot of what I was. I was exposed a lot to the codices. There, uh, the codices are the books that were written in pre-Columbian Mesoamerica, and I think there are only about 22 that survived, most of them in Europe, and I, I, I have uh, reproductions of about just all of one. They're all pictographs. It's, it's not writing. I've always been very attracted to them. And, and growing up in the culture that I did, you're surrounded by all of these symbols. What's interesting in Mesoamerica, the idea of sin, heaven, hell simply didn't, did not exist. If you didn't behave during your lifetime, you were punished during your lifetime. But where you went after you died had nothing to do with how you live. It had everything to do with how you died. If you died as a warrior, you went to the sun god as an eagle, and you carried the sun from dawn until noon, 
Then you come back as a hummingbird in the afternoon carrying messages. If you died in childbirth, you also joined the sun and carried the sun <clears throat> from noon until sunset. And in the morning, you'd come back as a butterfly, the monarch but butterfly, to bring the hearts of the warriors to the sun. Children that died before the age of five went to the land of the nursemaid tree, which was a big tree that dripped milk. And the little children would be restored back to health with this milk. And if you died of old age or another disease or whatever, you went to the Mitlan, the land of Mitlan Tecutli, the lord of the underworld. And it took you four years to reach there. You had to go through nine different obstacles. And it was during those four years that families were duty bound to give you the food and the tools necessary to reach the Mitlan. That's your roots of your Dia de Muertos in Mexico. Art is really a very strong uh, medium of, of universal com communication. When you start seeing the humanity of all of us, that we're all here in this little planet all together, and we all have different life experiences, and when you share them, then you have a greater sense of understanding. How else are we gonna ever get along? You don't reach out. That's the whole point of it all for me, not you know, some exhibit in some gallery. Reaching out to people, building bridges, and crossing those bridges, very important to me. Back here in Louisiana, the people of China have joined many in our state in working to preserve the legacy of General Claire Chenault. In our Louisiana Treasures segment, we're visiting the Chenault Aviation and Military Museum in Monroe to see how art and memorabilia are preserving the legacy of the leader of the Flying Tigers, who called Louisiana home. We're real proud in Northeast Louisiana that we have a true American hero. My grandfather went to China, to the Edo China, before any American did in 1937. What he was able to accomplish in China and set records that have never been broken to this day is an incredible story. And so here at the museum, we're very proud to be able to let not only Americans know, but Chinese. We have this new bilingual exhibit that tells the whole story of China from 1937 to 1945. We have a talking animatron of General Chenault where he can talk to you himself. We're very proud at the entrance of the museum. We have a statue that was donated to the state of Louisiana in 1976 of General Chenault and their appreciation of what he was able to do for their country. So, you know, this is something Louisianans can really be proud of, is our heritage and that we have this true American hero. The museum is part of the largest navigation school in World War II. We actually graduated over 15,000 navigators and we're very proud of that history because we supplied over half the war with their navigators. We have a robe that was worn by the last emperor of China, Puyi, that was given to my grandfather in appreciation. We have his Chinese medals that President Ma of Taiwan gave us special permission to have here and put on display. We also have his christening gown from 1893. We have his first wings, his stars. We have the largest collection of Chenault memorabilia than any place in the United States. Now and just in time for fall, Dean Arnold is a graphics designer and an Ohio illustrator who recently started working in a whole new medium. Pumpkins! His 3D creations of fleshy faces draw plenty of onlookers to his quiet neighborhood, where an army of heads watches over the sidewalk. This guy has his own personality and it, he doesn't share it with anybody else. I saw some extreme pumpkins that had, weren't like anything I'd seen before, and I just thought, that looks like an awful lot of fun. I, I should try that. Yeah, I've carved a jack-o'-lantern before. Let's see how far I could take it. Well, generally, I'm looking for the shape. 
Um, tall pumpkins make great open mouth scream faces um, or real, more realistic faces, um, whereas wide pumpkins make really great grins and you can really exaggerate the, the expression. Heaviness is a big thing too because the heavier it is, the easier it's going to be to carve. I don't hollow out the pumpkin, I just carve the surface of it. So all I do is shave off the, the rind and then just immediately start. First thing is to decide on an expression. The more extreme and exaggerated, the better. This could be a surprised face on this side. This could be a scowling face on this side. I like to know which way the stem is going to be facing. So I don't, I don't want to carve something that where, the, where the stem disappears and you don't see it later on. The way it starts is, is I, I take a large tool, a, sc a scraping tool, just at random expose some of the meat. Once I've gotten the rind off of, of the center area, I don't know what it's exactly it's going to be yet. All right, I have decided this one is going to be scowling with his brow, but he's going to be grinning widely with an evil grin. So I start just kind of digging out the eye orbits and around the nose. It depends on, on how the pumpkin cooperates with me. I have one X-Acto knife that I use for the, for the final tiny little details, like when I'm cutting the teeth or something like that. Um, but almost everything is, is just a scraping tool. These things are like sandpaper, it's like they make great smoothing tools. Whenever I get to this point, I have this overwhelming memory trace of when I'm at my dentist and my dental hygienist is flossing me. They all rot, they all rot at about the same pace, but they generally last about two days before the nose starts to shrivel up and, and dry. And, and usually by the time I do throw them out, it, I have to use a shovel. <laughs> Last year it was just an experiment to see if I could do it. This year is less of an experiment. It's, the, exper the experiment's still there, but now it's to see how well I can do it. I'm nuts, are you kidding? <laughs> it's a compulsion. That wraps it up for this week's program, but remember, you can always watch episodes of the show at lpb.org slash artrocks. And want more? Country Roads is a great place to find out about what's going on in the arts across the state. Until next week, I'm James Fox Smith, and thanks for watching.